Hi, Peter Mary, the fun wedding guy here, and today, as promised, I'm going to give you a critique of the little bit of footage we posted on Friday from uh, my earliest wedding footage from 1995. That was a wedding that took place in January at the Holiday Inn La Paz, which is no longer the Holiday Inn. <laughs> Got bought out and it's some other name now. Uh, it's pretty funny. Uh, but that was a place that I worked at quite frequently for the first couple of years of my career as a, a wedding entertainer. And there were several different things that jumped out at me as I watched that old footage. And so I thought I'd share with you the different critique items that I saw. And these are the kind of items that I would share with a fellow wedding entertainer if I went along to watch them on a wedding and, and then took notes to um, do a debrief afterwards. Um, taking the time to have somebody watch what you do and critique it can be very helpful. And uh, by sharing with you how I would critique myself, uh, critique myself, uh, hopefully you'll pick up a few items on how you can do the same for yourself as well. So the first thing that jumped out at me that everybody noticed as well was the fact that I wasn't wearing a jacket. Here I am serving as a master of ceremonies. I'm the person doing all the announcements and introductions and informing people about what's going on. And I've got the big white shirt and the fake faux vest. Uh, that would be a major, major faux pas right there. Uh, fashion faux pas to say the least. Not the first or probably the last I'll ever commit, but hopefully the last I'll commit at a wedding. Uh, I didn't know at the time, uh, obviously, that wearing a faux vest like that was just really out of bounds. You should really have a jacket on over a vest like that, because when you're not wearing a vest like that, it's apparent that it's a fake vest. It would be similar to wearing a dickie with no shirt over it to uh, hide the fact that it's not really uh, a turtleneck sweater. So uh, the same thing holds true uh, in this scenario, and I should have been wearing a jacket, and these days... I always wear a jacket. I never take it off. It's on constantly. In fact, I have a jacket that's kind of a velour fabric. It just looks a little bit different. I just like it. So um, one of the first things I noticed after that was when I got on the mic, I immediately started with the phrase, at this time. And that's a very common repetitive phrase that a lot of entertainers use, and I know I've been guilty of it for years. And it didn't come to my attention that I was even using it until my good friend Randy Bartlett called me while I was on my way to a wedding down in Laguna Beach about 10 years ago. And uh, he called me to uh, let me know that he found a new phrase that DJs say all the time, and that was, at this time. And we both chuckled about it and how DJs will say, at this time we're going to do this, and at this time we're going to do that. And it's just a throwaway filler phrase that gets used that has no meaning or value. <clears throat> and uh, so he and I are chuckling about it on the way to the wedding, and then I did the wedding, and on the way home I called Randy, and I just yelled at him on voicemail because I blamed him for the fact that I said at this time about 20 times at that wedding that night. Well, that wasn't the case. I went back and reviewed some old video footage, and sure enough, I was using this throwaway phrase all the time and just wasn't aware of it. There's this term called unconscious incompetence, and it means you don't know what you don't know. Until somebody else makes you aware of it, you go through life blindly doing those things that you don't know you don't know. And then when you become aware of them, you suddenly they stand out like big giant warts. So when I watched that footage and saw myself on two different occasions say at this time, I kind of cringed a little because I knew that that was a limited amount of footage and I knew that there was going to be a whole lot more if we were able to watch the whole wedding from one end to the, to the other. Another repetitive phrase I used was the term ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I used it about three times. Um, it's one of those things that if you say it over and over again, people start to treat it as a throwaway and it loses value and meaning. Now I've heard some DJs say, well, why not change it up? Why not say friends and family? I, I do. There are times that I'll say friends and family were, were about to watch as Joe and Sally cut their cake. And that's a different way of getting people's attention without using ladies and gentlemen. But the problem is recognizing that that phrase is used in the appropriate place and time. If you replace ladies and gentlemen with friends and family and you use friends and family 30 times in a night, you're still going to have table 13 laughing and pointing and starting a drinking game every time you say friends and family instead of ladies and gentlemen. Remember, as Roy Henschke said, a professional is somebody who does what they do the way that they do it because they intended to do it that way. When we use throwaway phrases that are too common and overused, people start to take us for granted and they don't pay attention to what we're saying, and that's not helpful. So then, after saying at this time, I said, the bride and groom are, are, are ready to come in. Are you ready to see them? And the crowd kind of responded weakly. And it was kind of a difficult question to ask the crowd. And I didn't have their undivided attention when I asked the question. And then I responded by saying, Ah, oh, come on. And then I did it again. And I got a much louder response. So I got the result I wanted. I got the crowd to cheer louder. But the problem was I did it by insulting the audience. And as the master of ceremonies, you should never be derogatory or insulting to your audience. You should never say, That was horrible. Let's try it again. 
You should always find a way to put it on yourself and lift them up. I've had occasions where they didn't respond as loudly as I wanted, and so instead I said, <laughs> you know what, I, I, I might not have done that right. Let me try that again. Friends and family, here come Joe and Sally, and then they cheer. So there are ways of getting them to make the noise that I want them to make without insulting them first. And it's a very important key to remember that as a formal master of ceremonies, the last thing I want to be doing is talking down to my audience. And then when I introduced the bride and groom, because of the way they chose to be introduced, I said, Mr. and Mrs. Rodelius and their three sons. I named the three sons, and when I finished naming them, I said, let's hear it for them. Why did I say that? Because I wanted them to cheer. But the truth was, I could have made them cheer if I just said the three boys' names correctly and enunciated it the right way and put enough energy into it. They would have started cheering automatically. They didn't need to be told to cheer. They were ready to start celebrating. But it was a common trap that I did, and if you look, you'll see that I say that phrase twice. I say it right at the end of introducing the first dance as well. So my three repetitive phrases were, at this time, ladies and gentlemen, and let's hear it for them, which don't need to be used in that context. Then when they're done and it's time to move on to the blessing for the meal, the first thing I say on the mic is, all right. And if you watch yourself on video, you might be surprised to find out that there's a phrase like that that you might say more often than you think. If you're a bride looking for a wedding entertainer, you should be looking for these kinds of things when you're asking to see video footage of somebody you're considering hiring. If they're saying, all right, every time they turn on the mic, that's their way of checking to make sure the mic volume is set right instead of having the confidence to just move forward and speak to the crowd. And if you watch the video, you'll notice that I announced the blessing for the meal, the prayer for the meal, and introduced the groom's father to lead in that blessing for the meal. He already had a cordless mic, which was great, but there was one problem. I rushed it. Because as he stands up to start praying, you see his son still trying to find his seat at the head table. The groom had not even made it to his seat yet, and I'm already announcing the prayer for the meal. So that was not good. I should have waited until they were in their seats and then should have formally introduced his dad to do the blessing for the meal, but I rushed it. And so that was another thing that I noticed was I was not in the moment. I was not paying attention to what was happening. I was just going on to the next thing on my checklist. So then at the end of the little pauses where we saw some background music, which really had no energy. Did you notice the background music sounded pretty quiet? It wasn't building energy. It wasn't getting people tapping their toes. Maybe the bride and groom picked it. Maybe I was playing it too low probably playing it too low. That's what I typically see. I then went on to introduce their first dance. And I started by saying, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, please. Big mistake. If a master of ceremonies has to ask for the attention of his crowd, he will never earn it. You need to earn their respect from the very beginning. And me insulting the crowd earlier led to me having to beg for their permission to talk again later. I should never have to ask for their attention. I should always have their attention every time I talk on the mic. And the way that I introduce myself to the audience and assert my authority as the master of ceremonies properly will set the tone for how quickly they pay attention to me from then on. But when I have to ask for permission, I'm now giving them control. I'm now giving the audience control over whether or not this event is going to be fun, going to flow well, have the energy it needs, and everything else. Because I'm now abdicating my role as master of ceremonies and saying, you're in charge, can I talk now? You should never be asking for their permission to speak. And then after I announced their first dance, what did I say? I said, let's hear it for them. If I would have just said their names properly and enunciated it and lifted my volume up just right, it was Marty and Michelle Rodelius. And now here comes Marty and uh, Michelle for their first dance as husband and wife. The song they chose was Have I Told You Lately by Van Morrison. Something as simple as that, if I had the audience's undivided attention, would have been enough to get them applauding. But I didn't have their attention, did I? The audience was still talking. And that goes back once again to the beginning. As the master of ceremonies, it's my job to own that room and have their undivided attention every time I speak. So those were just a few of the things that I took out of uh, that little tidbit. And that should give you a little bit of a glimpse into how critiquing works. If you haven't watched footage of yourself, I would challenge you as an entertainer to go back and watch it and look for some of these things. If you are a bride who's planning her wedding and you have not hired an MC yet, ask to see uncut footage like this so you can see for yourself exactly what they're doing, exactly what they're saying, and exactly how they're presenting themselves. It will be a big eye-opener. Thanks for watching The Fun Wedding Guy. I'm Peter Mary.